The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular program on the West Coast. Remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story, Miracle on 49th Street. No one knew better than Eddie Steckles that it would take a miracle to save him this time. He'd been up on murder counts before, but this was going to be the toughest one he'd ever faced. The prosecution had drawn all the high cards. His old friend, District Attorney Matthews, had sworn to get him. And Matthews would never let this one slip through his fingers in a million years. Yes, it would take a miracle, and Eddie was smart enough to recognize it. For it was only by grace of luck and a brilliant lawyer that he was out on bail, with only two weeks until the formal indictment. But Eddie wasn't one to give up easily, even when the odds were a million to one against him. Miracles had happened before, they could happen again. Even in a place like Hardy's Drugstore on 49th Street. Even to a character like his friend Dutch. Yep. Yeah. Uh, pike to smokes, huh? Uh, doors. Here you are. Fifteen. Oh. Thank you. Let's see now, I want an evening paper. Hey. Eddie! Oh, Eddie, I thought you were tied up with the lawyer here. Having a sandwich, eh? I'll have a coffee. Cup, cup, cup of coffee with you. Hey, hey Clark. Yeah, well, I'll pay. Uh, cup of coffee, huh? Gosh, Eddie, I, I saw Brandon yesterday. Sure looks tough. The DA ain't kidding this time. You know, I was telling Brandon that, that you... What's the matter, Eddie? Did I say something wrong? I'm sorry. I. Well, you see. Uh... Uh, I care. <laughs> Clark, huh? Here's your coffee. Cream? Uh, no. Uh, hey, there's a customer waiting over at the back counter. Oh, I see you. Uh, I'm sorry, Eddie. Always oh, opening my big mouth in front of all the wrong people. You can take over the whiskers now. What? What? <laughs> that voice you were using. If I'd have closed my eyes, I'd have sworn it was someone else. <laughs> what about Brandon, Eddie? He's a good lawyer. There's a way out. You can bet he'll find it out, find it for you. I'm sorry. I don't understand. What's the matter? Why, you're trying to kid me, are you? I'm afraid you've made a mistake. You see, my name is Oliver Littlefield. Oh, now, wait a minute. <laughs> you ain't trying to tell me. Listen, Eddie, I'm Dutch. Remember me, your pal, Dutch Watson? Oh, I'm... Happy to know you, Mr. Watson. Uh, this is rather embarrassing. You see, I am Oliver Littlefield. I don't know Eddie. I don't know you. I've never seen you before. Huh? Hey, wait a minute. Come here. Look at me. Holy cow, you're right. <laughs> Why don't you sit down, Eddie? I told you it's all tied up in a hard knot. I couldn't get you out of it if you were the governor. You get two weeks, ain't maybe. we? Maybe. Why, Brandon, what do you mean, maybe? You're a $50,000 lawyer. So is the DA, Eddie. And he's not playing for peanuts this time. 
He could recommit you tomorrow if he wanted to. What do you mean? I'm out on bail. Yes, today. Tomorrow you go back in if Mr. Matthews decides he has a case. And I think he has. <laughs> I'm sorry, Eddie. You're sorry. You shouldn't have shot that cop. Ah, shut up. There's got to be a way. There's got to be something. Give me a cigarette. Well, there's always one thing left. Yeah. I can run for it. Hmm. They'd be waiting for you with open arms in every city from New York to San Francisco, looking for you on every freight, pictures in all the post offices. No, you don't need a lawyer, Eddie. You need a miracle. Yeah. Eddie? Yeah. Eddie, Eddie, you'll never believe it. I can hardly believe it myself. Huh? Who is this? Dutch. I'm calling from a drugstore on 49th Street. There's a guy here, Eddie. A, a guy I sat right next to, maybe a foot away. What are you talking about? This guy. He's you, Eddie. Yeah, you drunk. Honest, honest, Eddie. I couldn't tell a guy from you if I was touching noises. I, I never seen anything like it normally like. All right, so what? Is that all you called me for? Well, I... Yeah, uh... shut up. I'm busy enough without having you blubber on the other end of a telephone line. So the guy looks like me, so what? What's the matter, Eddie? Nothing. Dutch. Dutch. Yeah. Tell that guy. Don't let him out of your sight. But, uh, He's still there, ain't he? Yeah, but why? Never mind why. Tell him. Follow him home, then get back here as fast as you can. Okay, Eddie. What was it, Eddie? Uh, you hear anything? No. Good. You're all through, Brandon. You can go now. Huh? You heard me beat it. I don't want to see you again. Are you crazy? Maybe. Crazy enough to think you're right, Brandon. I don't need a lawyer. I need a miracle. With the prologue of tonight's story, The Miracle on 49th Street, the Signal Oil Company is bringing you another strange story by The Whistler. But now, with only two hours and 52 and a half minutes left of the old year, it's interesting to look back on the changes 1945 brought in a commodity we found was mighty essential to our American way of life, gasoline. Remember, just four months ago, you A-book drivers were struggling along on only two gallons of gasoline per week. Two gallons. And as for quality, well, wartime restrictions made Motors express great unhappiness in slow starts, balky pickup, and pings. But that's all changed now. Today, you can again thrill to those three little words, fill her up. And when you fill her up with new signal gasoline, you're getting the finest gasoline made for motoring. In fact, new signal is really an entirely new type super fuel in which chemists actually rearrange the atoms in gasoline molecules to create amazing new power. But even this is just the beginning. For just as fast as still further advances are made in automotive or petroleum science, you will find them incorporated in an ever finer signal gasoline that will continue to merit the public preference, which has made signal grow in just 14 years from a mere handful of stations in Southern California to almost 2,000 signal dealers serving seven Western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, back to the whistler. Eddie, you're right. Your lawyer is no good to you now, with District Attorney Matthews piling up a murder case against you piece by piece like bricks in a wall. What you need is a first-class miracle, like the one Dutch ran into in the drugstore on 49th Street. A miracle in a gray tweed suit, five feet ten inches tall, 165 pounds, sitting up at the counter eating a ham sandwich. Oliver Littlefield is a miracle, isn't he, Eddie? He makes you remember the old wives' tale about there being a duplicate of everyone in the world and makes you believe it. You're not pacing the floor anymore, are you, Eddie? After Brandon leaves, you sit quietly in the chair for a while, thinking. Then you pick up the phone and call a friend of yours. Mike Castro? Hey, Mike, this is Eddie. Yeah, I'm out on bail. Hey, listen, Mike, got a job for you. Want to wire a joint for sound? Yeah, your dictaphones. Right. 
And uh, we might need some recording equipment and a 16-millimeter movie camera. Can you get over here in a half hour? Uh, Stanley Hotel. Okay, Mike, I'll be waiting. That was a cinch, Eddie. He lives in a little house in Wilmot, 40 minutes out of town. You get the address, Dutch? Yeah, 2224A Euclid Avenue. I'll have a little for you. 2214A Euclid Avenue, Wilmot. What's the matter, Eddie? Oliver Littlefield. I love him like a brother, Mike. I was thinking about it while I was telling him. It's quite a thing, ain't it? Yep, quite a thing. I uh, think maybe we all got the idea. A switch? Yeah. Yep. Uh-uh. You said you couldn't tell us apart, Dutch. Uh, it ain't that. He'll talk. He's got alibis. They'll check his prints. Now, ah, wait a minute. He won't talk because he'll be dead. Out in the highway somewhere. And they won't check his prints because he'll take one look at his face and write Eddie Steckles off the books as a gang murder. No, no, it won't work. I won't go for it. Why? It's crazy, that's why. Does 10,000 bucks sound crazy to you? Huh? Say it again. 10,000 bucks, cash on the line. 10,000 bucks? That's a lot of dough. Yeah. Okay, now, Dutch, you and Mike work together. And the first thing you do is steal a telephone truck. Huh? One of those little green babies I use for service in residence telephones. <laughs> What do you want? How do you do? Are you Mrs. Littlefield? Yes. Telephone company. Came to check the wire. What? Why, I didn't call into... Out of the service, madam. Every so often we have to check up. You know, connections get loose, insulation wears out. Well, that's strange. This has never happened before. You don't suppose you could come back a little later, could you? I was just leaving for the afternoon. No, no, it wouldn't work, ma'am. We have orders, you see. Uh, This is 2214A, isn't it? Yes. Uh... Perhaps if I called in and explained... No, uh, you'd only get us in trouble. Yeah, yeah, trouble. Well, all right then. You can go on in. I'll have to leave you alone here, though. Oh, don't worry about that, ma'am. We'll find everything all right. So you want a place to rent, huh? Yeah. It's awful tough. Haven't got a thing on my books except a shack over on Acacia Street. Fifty dollars a month. It's not worth fifty cents. Uh, that the one you advertised? Two, 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 five, uh, Casey? Yeah, that's it. Backs up on Euclid Avenue, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll take it. Look, Eddie. Out the back window here. Yeah, this is an awful dump. Yeah, but look. We're back to back with Littlefield. Mike ran the line from under the back porch to the fence and into the back bedroom. He's in there now, setting up that recording machine. Yeah, did you check on Littlefield? Sure, runs a hardware store just off the main drag. No other employees. Takes an hour and a half for lunch and hangs a sign in the door. You know, regular small town operator. Uh, you can't beat that guy. I told you I love him like a brother. You think it'll work, Eddie? Just watch me. Before the week's out, I'll know more about Oliver than he knows himself. Listen, a couple of things I want you to do for me tomorrow on the way to the library. Library? Yeah. We're going to get some books on the hardware business. On the way, I want you to stop in at the Bradshaw Bureau. What's that? Uh, They put out confidential financial reports. It'll cost you 20 bucks, but get one on Littlefield. Uh, It'll tell you what his investments are, how much he owes on his house, his earnings, all that kind of stuff. They won't ask questions. Yeah, just tell him he wants to borrow a thousand bucks from you on a personal note. Now, uh, where's Mike? Uh oh, this way. Hey, how you like this broken down joint I run it, huh? It's broken down, all right. How's it, Mike? Working perfect. Close the door, Dutch. Anything been doing? Yeah, they've been going at it. Quite a wife you've picked out for yourself, Eddie. Give a listen. They're in the dining room. The microphone's under the table. What happens if they go out of the room? Just a minute. I'll show you. Uh, well, what's he doing? Nothing coming through. 
probably standing in the hallway in his bathrobe. It's his old brown bathrobe, Eddie. She took the buttons off his good one in the ring her last week. Well, I suppose I might as well take my shower. There won't be any dinner until you do. And you'd better take some kerosene to those hands. They're full of green paint. Yes, dear, right away. And don't forget to clean your fingernails. All right, Cynthia, all right. But now what do you do? Watch. We faded out the dining room. Now we turn this dial up. it all figured out, haven't you, Eddie? The smart way. You're determined to make the most of the miracle on 49th Street. For the next week, you sit at the speaker, listening to the voices of Oliver and Cynthia, picked up by the efficient microphones Mike Castro has installed under tables and behind pictures in the Littlefield house. You make records and play them over and over, learning the little details Oliver and Cynthia agree on, the things they argue about practicing the inflections of Oliver's voice, absorbing his personality. Try it again, Dutch. Uh, from where? Uh, from the part about the roses. Okay. Oliver, I was talking to Mrs. Gray again today. She says we simply have to do something about those roses. They're all covered with mildew. Huh? Well, what was that, Cynthia? Oh, you weren't even listening. I said the roses are all covered with mildew. I don't know how many times I've told you to bring home some spray. And that isn't all. The snails are in the pansy bed. Uh, I'm sorry, Cynthia. I forgot it again. I'll be sure to bring some spray home tonight. Oh, I don't know what's got into you lately. I'm getting tired of your nagging after all these years, Cynthia. That's what's got into me. All this picking and jabbing is getting on my nerves. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll go to work. Why, Oliver? All right, Cynthia. I'm sorry. <laughs> there you are, boss. What a day to be tied up to. Okay, uh, now read me the speech about the pansy beds. Uh, pansy beds? Uh, oh, yeah, uh, see now. Uh, oh, here. That, uh, oh, you mean I gotta play it on that dame again? Yeah. Oh, well, all right. I don't know how many times I told you to bring some spray home. And that isn't all. The snails are into the pansy beds. I'm sorry, Cynthia. I forgot it again. I'll be sure to bring some spray home tonight. I don't know what's got into you lately. I'm getting tired of your nagging after all these years, Cynthia. That's what's got into me. All this picking and jabbing is getting on my nerves. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll go to work. Why? Oliver? All right, Cynthia, I'm sorry. Yeah, what's wrong with that? Oh, nothing. <laughs> You're in the wrong racket, boss. It's perfect. <laughs> Eddie, it is perfect, but you don't stop there. At every spare moment, you're studying up on the hardware business, learning the details of Oliver's financial dealings from the confidential reports Dutch brought you. And Mike has been busy, too, with a movie camera, photographing Oliver from an automobile parked across the street from the hardware store, or while he stands innocently on a street corner as Oliver hurries off to lunch. You study the pictures carefully, Eddie, capturing his walk, his nervous little mannerisms. But there's still something missing. You know practically nothing about his friends and neighbors, the people they play bridge with on Thursday nights, the members of Oliver's Lodge, the things you'll have to know about. It worries you, doesn't it, Eddie? And then all of a sudden, you get another big break. One afternoon, as you're bending over your books, Mike comes into the room. Well, Eddie, I hope you can get by on the records we already made. Why? There ain't going to be no more. What's the matter? Machine break down? Cynthia left town last night on the 1115 train. Going to visit her mother's. Huh? Heard Oliver telling the guy next door. Uh, Can't make records if you ain't got no one to talk to. Yeah, yeah. Tough break, huh? No, not exactly. Huh? What do you mean? Mike, did anyone except Mrs. Littlefield see you the day you came to repair the phone? Uh, no. You sure? Yeah, Why? Did you find yourself a camera, a speed graphic like the newspapers use? Well, what's that got to do Could with... you find one? Yeah, sure. Okay, but... get one and buy yourself a new suit. What? Huh? Tomorrow night, you're going to call on Oliver. You're from Snap, the photo magazine, and you're assigned to do a story on the typical American citizen, the average guy who lives in the suburbs. What he does in his spare time at home, who his friends are, what they do, his hobbies, the clubs he belongs to, you know, regular feature story. And the guy the committee selected is the average citizen... 
is Oliver. Now, see here, Mr. Dickinson, I don't know... Now, Mr. Just... Littlefield, there'll be nothing to it. Well, you've come at a rather bad time. My wife is away. We can get pictures of her later, Mr. Littlefield, and, of course, you'll get the usual fee of $500. Five? Hundred dollars? Yep. I can spend the afternoon with you here on the interview, and tonight we'd like to have a little party for you. At the magazine's expense, of course. <laughs> we can invite all your friends and take pictures. You'll get yourself a lot of nice publicity. Do you a lot of good in the hardware business. How did you know I was in the hardware business? Uh, uh, we went into that before you were selected. Always check up a little before we decide. Well, um, how about it, Mr. Littlefield? Well, I don't really want publicity, but... But you could use the 500, huh? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, I could. Good. I knew you'd be a sport. Now, suppose we get down to business, huh? First, I'll uh, get a list of all your relatives, where they live and what they do, that kind of stuff, and then we'll check up on your... <laughs> I'm Mrs. Lake. I live down the street a few doors. 2228 Euclid, that is. Known the Littlefields, well, ever since they came here in 1927. Oliver was working for the gross department store in the hardware department, and my husband, Clem, he was in the men's ready-to-wear. My name is Barton, pastor of the Congregational Church. Oliver's been a member for more than ten years. I'm his Aunt Sarah. I guess when you get right down to it, I'm his only living blood relative. I'm... Well, there it is, Eddie. Everything you need right there in the book, complete with photographs. You were right, weren't you? In a matter of ten days, you've learned more about Oliver Littlefield than he knows himself. And it's none too soon. Hurry! Uh, Eddie, you, you seen the papers? What's the matter? Look. Huh. Eddie Steckles, fugitive from justice. <laughs> they record your bail. When did this come out? About an hour ago. Yeah, that's okay. Where's Mike? He's coming. Did he give Oliver the 500 bucks? No, no, he stole him off. Said he'd have a check for him tonight. Mm, the guy's getting smart. Beginning to think for himself. We better get it over with, Eddie. It, it don't look so good. Huh? But the neighborhood's full of patrol cars. Maybe somebody called the magazine office or something. Yeah, you get the jitters. Uh-huh. When Mike came out of Oliver's house tonight, he says there was a guy standing across the street that he could have swore was a plainclothes dick. Well, forget it. We got to take a chance. It's tonight or not at all. Call Oliver and tell him we'll be around about 8 o'clock to pay him off. <laughs> Which way, Eddie? Uh, take the next road to the right. That's it, up there by the sign. Now, oh, see here, what's this all about? I haven't done anything. Shut up, Wh Oliver. Just keep your hands up, that's all. That's better. Uh, around to the right, Dutch. How far, Eddie? Uh, anywhere along here. Uh, this okay? Yeah, sure. Come on. I know what you're going to do. You're going to kill me. Listen, let me explain. Shut up. Come on, Oliver. Eddie. Yeah, right behind you. He's all yours, Eddie. No, please don't kill me. Hmm. Nice work, Eddie. No, Mike. Not Eddie. Oliver Littlefield, remember? Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. But first, a word about the 248 people who were killed in auto accidents over the Christmas holiday. Reports already indicate that tonight's total will be even higher. Driving conditions are not good. Cars are old. Many people are at the wheel tonight who should not be. If you don't absolutely have to go out tonight, don't. But if you must drive, take it easy. I know that with new signal gasoline in your tank, there's great temptation to step on the accelerator. But don't tonight. Keep the speed down. 
keep a sharp eye on the other drivers and the pedestrians. You see, your signal dealer isn't only interested in your business. Because he's your neighbor and your friend, he's also interested in you. That's why he's asked me to bring you this message, so that one of tonight's auto accidents may not mar the happy new year, which all of us in the signal organization hope will be yours. And now, back to the whistler. Yes, Eddie. It was a miracle that sent Oliver Littlefield to you at the exact moment when you could use him best. And you knew how to make the most of it, didn't you? You've already decided what's going to happen from here on. How you will suddenly disappear from Wilmont one fine morning without telling anyone where you're going. There'll be gossip about Oliver Littlefield finally wearying of his nagging wife. But after a month or so, it'll die down. South America, the Pacific Coast, Canada. There's lots of opportunity, isn't there, Eddie? Plenty of room for the smart ones. You abandon the car, Eddie Steckel's car, on the highway and hitch a ride back to town. Outside of a slight pinch in the shoulders, Oliver's gray tweed suit fits perfectly. Almost as well as your clothes fit him back there in the trees on that side road. It's 11 o'clock when you finally get back to 1214A Euclid Avenue and fit Oliver's key in the lock on the front door. You know, there's a light switch. The way up with the door. Yeah, now I... Who are you? Why, Oliver, don't you know me? Oh, uh, oh I'm sorry, of course I... Sure, you know me, Oliver. Uh, Your wife wanted some work done in the garden. She called Matt. Oh, oh yes, the, the spray. Yeah, the spray. And there was something else, Oliver. The spading. You didn't know about that, did you? Uh, see, here, I... My name's Patoli, Oliver. From headquarters. What do you mean? You didn't know about the spading she'd ordered in the back of the yard. Or you wouldn't have buried her there the day before that class. Buried her? Sure. You shouldn't have killed her with arsenic, Oliver. Too easy to find in a post-mortem. Oh. That's it, huh? Put down that gun. Yeah. Hmm. Packing a gun. <laughs> Who would have thought it of a punk like Oliver Littlefield? Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Harold Swanton and Charles Smith, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>